Hey everybody. <laughs> good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you guys are around the world. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. So usual live Q&A on Monday afternoons, and today we're gonna be going over module 11, which is nursery management and seed starting. So hopefully you uh, got a chance to check out that module. Um, there was It was a pretty dense module. There was a lot of stuff in there from just about a, ha, keeping a nursery and all the little things you need to do with that. Also seed starting, soil blocking, hardening off. Um, there was a lot of stuff in there. Um, so I, hopefully you guys are coming in with a bunch of questions today. And like usual, just want to start off by saying thank you to our sponsor, Paper Pot Co., for sponsoring the entire course and making this possible. And I know I say this every live and in every um, every module as well, but this course wouldn't, I, this would never have happened without their help because I couldn't have put in this much time to then give it away for free. Um, I really do mean that. So please go check out what they have to offer for sale over there. Also check out Diego's podcast, Farm Small, Farm Smart, and Carrot Cash Flow. And um, just so I, let them know you appreciate what's going on and um, thank them for their support of, you know, educating the farming community. So it means a lot to, to me personally, and I know it should to a lot of you guys out there as well. And on top of that, um, there will be something interesting in the next module from Paper Pot. So just saying. <laughs> so make sure you tune in. Um, and uh, yeah, let me know what questions you have. So if, you, if you're just tuning in for the first time or whatever, uh, we'll take questions on the module, module 11. And then when those questions are exhausted, I will then t take uh, general questions. So first I wanna give priority to questions on the module. So let's get into that. Um, welcome everybody. All right, let's see here. What's up, Jay? <laughs> uh, Kevin, no one's gonna tell you. No one's gonna tell on you. So uh, just a tempo, is that just in time? Um, yeah, so if you don't know, these these modules stay up, or not these modules, these live Q&As stay up on YouTube so you can watch them later. Um, if you missed them, uh, you can go back. Like if you watch a module and then you think, oh, I have a couple questions about that, you might wanna watch the um, the live Q&A so you can see if any of those questions got answered. But Or if you just like to listen to me talk for an hour. <laughs> All right. Johnson, bonjour. I make no effort <laughs> to pronouncing French words. I'm awful. <clears throat> Good morning. Okay. All right. Let's see here. All right, Abraham. Good to see you back here on uh, the Q and A. Did you ever have to overcome planting seeds too deep? I have a batch of healthy Salanova seeds that I planted that are all a bit alive, but suffering. Um, I have never really, I mean, my soil blocks are pretty small, so I haven't really had that problem. But what do you mean by, I mean, if they germinated, then that's most of the battle. Like if they've gotten up out of the soil, then you should be good. Um, unless you're planting them like several inches deep, maybe that would be an issue. But if they popped up and germinated, you're probably good. So if they're suffering, it's probably from sunlight or or not or the right different the wrong moisture i'm guessing but what do you mean by struggling let me know hey milton puerto rico all right so the one thing about salanova and lettuce in general and i don't know like where you are abraham but um is temperature so lettuce is kind of specific in what temperature germinates and then if, if it's too cold, it'll grow too slowly. If it's too hot, it will not grow right either. So there's only so many variables. Uh, the other option is, you know, how old is your seed um, and how it's been stored. But generally, like, those are the main things. It's, you know, your seed quality. Um, usually, if it's struggling, like, in the first week, it's not even the, so the, the potting mix because it doesn't really need very many nutrients right after it germinates or right when it germinates. And then it's either, maybe it's too west, wet or not wet enough, and then amount of sunlight. So those are the only variables, really. Um, all 
Okay. Yeah, older seeds. I mean, another thing to remember about um, not just Salanova seeds, but any pelleted seed in general, um, I don't know the exact process that they go through to make pelleted seed, but it changes the storage ability. They don't, pelleted seed doesn't last as long as non-pelleted seed. Uh, I don't know if it's like they like start the germination process or something happens. So uh, there's something going on with, with the process in which they make pelleted seed that makes them store uh, not as well. So yeah, I had trouble. Um, it was in my first season, I didn't refrigerate my seeds. And then even towards the end of the summer, end of the, you know, end of my first season, some of the seeds were kind of not doing so well. So either just make sure you buy new seeds every year try not to buy too many and then I just keep them in the fridge and so I'm still growing seeds from that I bought last winter like not this winter but the winter before like December January February like over a year ago and they're fine I've just been keeping them in the fridge all sealed up so maybe that's it I don't know Milton Florida Puerto Rico Hey Johnson, are heat mats worth it? Great question. Um, I didn't talk about heating very much in the nursery. Yeah. So let's talk about heating for a little bit um, because that's definitely something that a lot of people have to deal with. And I guess I didn't really talk about it because I haven't used any heating and it's been fine. So it depends on where you are. So you said you were in, Johnson, sorry. You're in Canada. So yeah, it is cold uh, when you're starting early in the season. So they can be worth it for sure. I know a lot of people use heat mats because they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, another option is to use some sort of space heater or uh, just be safe with all this stuff, of course, inside of your nursery. I think if I was to get into more starts that I needed to get warm early, I would look into get making heated tables. And... The best thing, I, the sort of the, I forget what they use. There's some people that run something in sand, make like a big table, and they run like, I want to say like rope light or something. I don't remember. Some sort of something in there. And then my favorite thing was what Spencer, I saw Spencer Rudolph do, who, if you don't know who he is, he's the, the owner of Sage Hill Ranch Gardens. I did a bunch of videos with Spencer, uh, both for my channel and No-Till Growers channel. And Spencer had a really cool system where he took radiant floor heating that you'd put like in your bathroom, like under the tile. And he bought that and a really simple thermostat. And I think he said it was like 150 bucks per table and just did like a, I forget how big his tables were. I'm guessing they were like four by eight or something. And then just like ran the, um, the, the, the coil or the, the wire that you'd run under the tile and then put some sort of like plastic on it. And I wanted to get the details from him, but he said he was going to redo his design. And then uh, he, I would talk to him, but I never wound up making the table. So I never got the information from him. So I think heat mats can work, but if you need a lot of them, like if you're on scale, I think you should start thinking about other things. Um, the other thing with heat mats you can do is you can add like row cover or even small pieces of greenhouse plastic over your tables inside of your greenhouse too, to like help hold in the heat a little bit. But of course, it only kind of help if you had a solid base on the table to sort of hold the heat in. So I haven't used heat mats. Um, but again, if it's a small amount, then sure. Um, or one thing you can do is just bring the trays inside your house to, just to get them to germinate. As soon as you see them come up, then just bring them outside, uh, bring them out to your nursery. I don't know if your, your nursery is a, like a light situation or a greenhouse or something. Um, that's another option too, is if, you, if, you, if you're worried about just the germination part of it, like bring it inside, let it germinate. But as soon as they start popping up, they're going to need light. So make sure they get outside um, under sunlight. And same thing is true in the summertime. If it is too hot in your nursery to, uh, to germinate lettuce, for example, if you're doing lettuce or cool weather crops, you can bring that inside and have that germinate. Some people even put it in their rock and refrigerator. Um, just to get it to germinate and then bring it outside. Um, but you just have to make sure that that seed starts. So I think that's mainly what you're going to be using heat mats for, unless it's super cold for an extended period of time where you need like heat for your like tomatoes and stuff like that as they're growing, then maybe you need a bigger sort of system for that. But 
Yeah, there's a lot of options out there for sure, but it might be worth getting one or two and trying it. I mean, it's not a big investment. See how it works for you. Uh, Pierre, Pierre Ann, thanks for the question. So soil blocking, what's the best blend of soil? So I don't make my own soil mix. I don't recommend that people do. I recommend that you try to buy the best thing you can. Uh, if you, if you follow the no-till growers channel, Jesse made a great video about why he doesn't make his own potting mix either. And I think a lot of people want to do everything themselves. And I understand that completely. I, I am one of those people that really enjoys that, but the best sort of potting mix you can get is, in my opinion, if you can get one that's compost based, that's the best. So places like Tilth Soil, Vermont Compost, there's a, there's a lot of other places out there, but ones that I think have a, a compost element to it, I think is going to give you the most biology and the most nutrients and stuff. Um, but the best thing to do is try to find something locally if you can, or regional, if it's regional. Uh, right now I'm not, I should probably look into that. I'm buying Coast of Maine. Uh, mainly because my farm store that I go to has it and they always have it and it's a little bit more expensive. And I, I've said several times, make sure you spend the money up front on potting mix because it helps your farm in so many ways. So not just healthy starts, but then that little bit of potting mix goes into your beds and becomes an amendment as well. So as you say, buy the best thing that you can and you know, keep in mind if you are certified organic, make sure you, you understand what you need to do there, getting organic, all everything. Um, there's a lot of options out there, but make sure it's not just like, uh, like for example, I was using Sun, Sun Grow Professional Growing Mix for a long time for uh, my, my microgreens because they don't really need much nutrition, and, but there's not much stuff in there that's mainly like just peat moss and perlite and couple other things. So make sure there's some nutrients in it. Um, I, as I said, in the module, in the nursery module that I don't recommend like using extra fertility and sprays and soap, like all that stuff, like just buy really good potting mix when the starts are ready, get them out in the field. So there's going to be different stuff available depending on where you are, but I would say definitely spend, like if you see a couple, like try to buy the best thing you can, it's totally worth it. Hey, Justin, does the vermiculite help keep your soil blocks from rooting together? Um, no, that just helps with the moisture retention on the surface um, just to get things to germinate. I think that's all it helps with. No, the root, the, when you have soil blocks and they're bounding together with the roots, that has nothing to do with what's going on the surface. That's just because the, the plants got too big. So... Yeah, you want to be careful with things like squash and cucumbers. Um, they're, if you damage the roots, like they're very fragile before they get in the ground, so you want to be careful. So sometimes you can try to space out the blocks a little bit more um, or use less blocks per tray and give each block a little bit more room. Like don't put them right up against each other if you can. That's helpful for, for squash and um, and cucumbers and stuff. So yeah, that's one thing. Or And or use bigger blocks or... Uh, just get them out into the field sooner. So yeah, the vermiculite is just really to help with that um, moisture retention to get the seeds to germinate. I don't even think it's really necessary. I've just been doing it for a while and I, I, the results have been good. So I've been kind of sticking to it, but you could definitely just, as I said in the module, just pinch the tops of the soil blocks or just add some more uh, potting mix on top. All those things would be fine. But for, as far as I know, because the vermiculite is just on the surface, that's not really gonna affect how the soil blocks uh, interact with each other. Hey, Kevin. Um, <laughs> not laughing at you, Kevin. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. <laughs> oh, man, Jesse. <laughs> if you guys don't know, like when I was doing microgreens, I'll come back to your, your question in a second, but everyone used to just ask me this question in every single, anytime I talk about microgreens, what do you do with your microgreen trays? Yes, they always get composted, but I don't grow microgreens anymore, Jesse. All right, uh, back to Kevin's question. <laughs> um, so the thing about uh, if your seedlings are weak, they're probably not getting enough light. That's my guess. Um, they're probably getting too leggy and they're stretching out and they're not getting strong enough. So that's probably one thing. Uh, so they need more light or uh, if you're using, you're going inside under lights, make sure you have uh, proper grow lights and they're on for long enough. Also lights 
in general, their color tends to shift over time. So if you're using lights that are older, their color spectrum tends to shift and their intensity, I think, drops as well. So just because maybe when you had, when you bought them, they were working well, maybe over time they tend to not work as well. So that's the first thing I would consider is light for sure. Uh, the other thing is nutrients. If they're they're getting pretty big and then they start struggling, that's another option too. So potting mix would be be part of that. Bunch of zinnia seeds, unpelleted. They're all different varieties. So, okay, sorry. Old leaves are belted. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you have too much moisture, like it'll get it'll get gnarly in there. So bring make sure you have enough airflow in there, and just make sure that you're being careful with your uh, with your watering. So Abraham, this is a great question about watering because I think that's what we're getting at here with some of your issues. Um, things should be wet, but they shouldn't be soaking wet, right? So just like when you're watering out in the field or in your tunnels, you know, the soil should have some moisture to it, but shouldn't be like dripping with water. Uh, that's just the only way I can describe it. And I think, and you don't want them to dry out completely because if they, if, if soil blocks, example, for example, dry out completely, they're really hard to get... Um, hydrated again. So you got to be constantly watering them. Um, I, I tend to have a bad habit of overwatering things as well. So yeah, I mean, you just got to make sure that the soil is wet, but not like, like muddy, you know what I mean? So just has some moisture in it for sure. And don't let it dry out. And I know there's no like way to quantify any of this stuff, but that's a lot of farming is like by feel for sure. Hey, Milton, does pelleted seeds need to be sown deeper than regular seeds? I don't think so. Just make sure they're in contact with the soil and they're covered and staying moist. Oak knob. Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely an option for sure. I just haven't used them, so I can't really speak on, like, if it's cost-effective and those sort of things. Oh, everyone's chiming in about heat mats. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I keep my seeds in the refrigerator. Um, I just try to, I don't get like crazy about sealing them up and stuff. I think if you are really hardcore, you can like seal them up, like get all the air out and stuff. And then like the, you, some seeds you can freeze, I think. I'm not an expert in this stuff. I've just been keeping everything in the fridge and it's been it's been good. Like everything's been lasting uh, for longer than I anticipated. So yes, I keep my seeds in the fridge. Hi from Louisiana. Hi from work. <clears throat> hey, Ted, having a problem with German ting pepper seeds. So one thing about peppers is they take forever to germinate. Not, I don't know about every pepper, but every pepper that I've ever grown takes like way longer <laughs> than you think. So just be patient. Um, peppers in general are very long crop. So not only are they a long time to germinate, they're a long time in the nursery, they're a long time in the field. Peppers take a long time. And then like once the green, the peppers come out and they're green and you're like, when are they gonna change color? Peppers, patience with peppers. That's all I have to say. Uh, slow cookers with water in them because they have a thermostat made for long. Yeah, so if you watch the module, um, there's people that use stand-up freezers for germination chambers and they put a crock pot in the bottom of the of the freezer with water in it and then use a two-stage thermostat so it has a uh, like an outlet that controls heat an outlet that controls cold so the cold will get plugged into the freezer and the hot will get plugged into the or the heat will get plugged into the, the crock pot so then they can really regulate the temperature up and down um, so that's a great way to do that for pretty cheap um, and again if you are only trying to get things to germinate in the winter time then you know freezer doesn't have to work if you're just warming it so there's another option for you yeah Hey, Milton, um, hot year round in Puerto Rico. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so lettuce likes to germinate like 65, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's hard to germinate them in the heat for sure. 
So yeah, if it's inside, still, I don't know how cool it is inside where you are, if it's air conditioned or, or whatever. So it just needs to be cooler for sure. Um, they won't germinate when it's really, really hot outside. And they don't need light to germinate, right? So if the lights are adding heat too, you could turn the lights off just until you see them pop. But as soon as they break the surface, make sure you get light on them or they're gonna get leggy real fast. Growing lettuce in floating raft beds in aquaponic system. I seem to be like white flies. Um, I have no idea what what that means. <laughs> I've never done aquaponics, so I don't know. Maybe take a break with them. Try to switch up some crops for a little while. Uh, are you in a closed system? Like if you're in a if you're in a greenhouse that's completely sealed up, then you may not have anything in there that's fighting against those those pests. So, you know, for me, I, I'm letting the good guys try to come in and take care of the bad guys as much as possible. So, yeah, there's a lot of question marks I'd have about that. But if you're growing outside, like, you know, there's got to be something to battle it. If there isn't, then if you don't break the cycle, there's going to keep feasting on whatever you keep putting in there. Yep, hot compost is great. Um, did I talk about this in the module? I don't know if I did. Maybe it was a different, no, it was a winter growing one maybe. So Wild Hope Farms got some really cool systems. I made a video, I think it's on the No-Till Growers channel. It's called Compost Heated Greenhouse. And they have a really cool system where they have barrels that are lined on the north side of their greenhouse. And then they dump a bunch of, I think like straw and, and horse manure and stuff. And they let that compost and that heat will penetrate through um, through the greenhouse. So a lot of options for heating for sure. Um, and then they had another system there that was part of that. They had uh, lines that ran underneath the ground that then circulated through their other greenhouse to try to move some of the heat over there too. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways to uh, do inexpensive heating for sure, especially if you are making compost or have access to those sort of ingredients. All right, how do I feed my plants in my soil block? Just water on top or do you soak them? So I don't feed them with anything. All of their nutrition until they go out in the field is just what's in the soil block. So I've said that before, like make sure you buy a good potting mix that has fertility in it and you wouldn't, you don't have to add any more. Um, if you're doing some long-term crops, like let's say you're doing tomatoes, uh, I'll start them in a smaller block and then I'll put them in a bigger block with more potting mix. So that'll feed them there too. So I just overhead, um, water all my trays. I have that, if you saw the, the module, I have an overhead watering system that I can just put on a timer and it has this nice mist that happens. And then I have a um, hand sprayer that I go through as needed and just water plants. So if things are looking a little dry or if I just planted something and needs a little bit extra water uh, or for whatever reason, something got missed, something's not working, um, you just I just hand water them. But bottom watering works great as well. So if you haven't done that before, you just need a solid 1020 tray to go under your tray. And that could be like the, the trays that I use for soil blocking or um, regular cell trays, or probably even, I don't know about wind strips. They, I don't know the size of those, but basically you put a solid tray under there and you just add some water to, you lift up the, the, the tray that's got the seedlings in it. You put some water in there and you put it back down and then just take a look. If you open it up and there's water under it, don't add any more water. If you open it up and it's completely dry, add a little bit of water. So that's how I used to do all my microgreens too, uh, especially when I was growing inside because inside I can't be spraying water everywhere. And also there's it's on a rack with lights, so I can't be spraying water everywhere. So yeah, that works as well too, either way. Either way. But for me, I'm just watering overhead. Um, so that was... Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's an overhead system and then the watering wand is called the Wonder, Wonder Water, I think is what it's called. Um, really fine mist um, sprayer. Hey, Abraham. Uh, and I haven't really seen a lot of a variation. I buy the, 
I forget what color the bag is. I think it's like the seed propagation mix or something. They have a bunch of different ones. They have one that's, which I think mine's like the green bag. I should know this. And then there's like the purple bag. So they have different like size pieces and stuff that's in there. And then they also have one that's like more hardcore too. That was like really expensive. Um, I think it was a little overkill, but it's been fine. Like I haven't really had any complaints, but if you're going through pallets of them, then you probably are doing enough where you're going to see the changes from pallet to pallet. Me, like I'll buy a bunch of bags and it'll last me a few months. And by then the season's changed and some, there's other variables too. So I haven't noticed it, but if you're going through that much, you probably would. Uh, I would probably reach out to the company and ask them what's going on. Especially if you're buying that much of it, then you're you know you're a big customer and they'll probably listen to you or try to help you out. So, and if there's something wrong in their process, they probably want to know about it as well. All right, great questions today, guys. What is something you would never do as a transplant? And what is something you would only ever do as a transplant? So carrots, I would never do as a transplant. So those have to get direct seeded. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, baby greens, spinach. Uh, you could transplant spinach, I guess. Uh, what else? This is going to be in the direct seeding module, which will be in a couple weeks. Radish. Like hackerai turnips. I'm trying to think of the things I've grown before, but yeah, all the baby greens, direct seed, and then everything else gets transplanted. So uh, one that could go either way is beets. I just never have good luck uh, direct seeding beets, so I just transplant them. But everything else, like lettuce for sure, transplant. Um, as I said, the next module will be all about transplanting, so that'll be out on Thursday. Purpling. Is that too much moisture, I think? Not sure. <laughs> Sorry, just reading through some comments. Uh, having issues getting seedlings up to transplant sides and soil blocks, should I be fertilizing after first two leaves? This is true across all veggies. Comes back to the potting mix you're buying. If you buy a decent potting mix, I have not had any issues with getting them up to size. So if it is an issue, like you just literally cannot buy bigger, uh, more expensive, better quality potting mix, or you just have a lot to go through, you can always beef up your potting mix a little bit, mix in some compost. You could do... Um, drenches and other kinds of things adding I don't even do this stuff so I don't know I can't give you specific instructions but you know um, fish emulsions and stuff like that but mainly it's you just don't have it's it's those those conditions I said temperature potting mix moisture and light those are the those are the big things for sure um, so I don't fertilize them and as I said if I'm doing something that takes a long time that needs to be bigger. I'll start them in small blocks and then pop them into larger blocks like tomatoes, for example, or peppers. And then they'll get that extra boost of nutrients from when they get potted up. Uh, we talked about this before, James. You can go either way. Um, I've just been overhead watering because it's my system's kind of set up for it. And when you have a large enough space where you can just water, it's definitely a time saver. If you're if you have bottom watering going on, then it's going to take longer because you have to walk around and open up each tray and check in and add water. For me, like I have my system where everything gets watered on a timer and then I can check it and water by hand if I need to uh, make any adjustments. But if you are like inside bottom watering makes sense, you can do either with soil blocks for sure. Uh, I don't really want to get into microgreens um, but I have not used any soilless mixes. Uh, I was using mostly the SunGrow Professional Growing Mix. Um, I actually did a video years ago on the channel where I tested different kinds of potting mix and stuff for, 
uh, microgreens, and it like really didn't matter very much. So I don't know. It's been years since I've grown them. I'm sure there's different things going on than when I was doing it. Maybe not. I don't know. Hey, Pierre, and um, so my nursery, it hopefully you saw the module. It has doesn't have any heating. It has two fans and louvers on opposite sides. So like one fan and one louver is on one thermostat and one fan and one louver is on the other thermostat and they're diagonal. So I have one thermostat set at 65 Fahrenheit and one set at 70 Fahrenheit. Um, so I'm trying to keep it between like 65 and 70 as best as possible just because most of the time I'm germinating lettuce. So that's where I like to keep it. So as soon as it hits 65, it'll start cooling off. And if it gets above 70, then both fans will be running and just trying to keep it down below 70 as much as possible. It definitely does not get that low, especially in the summertime. So germinating stuff in the summer can be challenging for sure. Um, if you are in Texas with your saying and starts in August, you, if you're in full sun, you probably have, you probably need shade cloth on your nursery during the middle of the summer anyways, just because otherwise the temperature in there would be insanely high. But if you're trying to germinate, let's say fall crops, and this is, this is a real struggle. I, I, you know, if you are in a warm area, like in the South and Texas is warmer than it is here in North Carolina, I find that doing your fall crops is really hard because you're starting all those crops when it's super hot outside. And then you have to get all that started before it starts to cool off and the light drops. And for me here, I always say it's around Halloween when the weather just changes. Like all of a sudden it's not hot anymore. The light starts dropping very quickly. It's always around Halloween here. So you have to get everything like big enough and out in the field and big enough out in the field before that happens. Otherwise things will be growing like all winter and it'll take forever. So that's definitely a struggle. So one thing is definitely trying to get them to germinate. So if you're doing like um, cool weather crops or, you know, fall brassica, stuff like that, like you got to keep it cool enough for them to germinate. So maybe just germinate them inside your house or in your garage or in a basement, if you have a basement, somewhere where it's cool. And then as soon as you see it germinate, get it out under light. But if you're in, in Texas and trying to do it in the summer, then you probably need shade cloth uh, on your nursery as well and then misting and all the other things you can do to try to keep the temperature down. <clears throat> there you go. Um, beneficial nematodes. Uh, yeah. Jesse told me that recently too. <laughs> but yeah, like I was saying, like if you don't, if it's a closed system, we're going back to the question about white fly in the uh, uh, aquaponic situation or hydroponic situation. If there's no balance there, if there's a pest in there, it's just going to keep eating away. There's nothing that's eating the pest. Uh, I will do a module on pests uh, later on in the course for sure. So let's take a quick break. And, and again, thank the sponsor of the course, Paper Pot Co. And I say this all the time, but I really do mean it. Uh, this was a huge undertaking for me and still ongoing. And for me to take the time to be able to put this out for free on YouTube is only made possible from Paper Pot. So go check out what they have for sale over there. Um, lots of cool stuff and also Diego's podcast. So check all that stuff out and, you know, let them know you're enjoying the course. And, uh, I really appreciate all their, their support for sure. And as I said, if you missed it at the beginning of the live, there'll be something special from paper pot in the module on Thursday. So, uh, just giving you a little heads up on that, not telling you what yet. All right. Back to the questions here. Are there specific transplant times for soil blocks? How do you know when they are ready? Okay, so I talked about this in the module. Make sure, what, soil blocks will give you a wider window of time when they're available. So because of the way soil blocks are, when the plants get bigger, they'll air prune. And that's when the roots um, go to the edge and stop growing. So they won't like wrap around the the start. And so they can, they can hang out a little bit longer. But basically... Um, you want them strong enough where, you know, they can support themselves, where you think they're going to be okay out in the field. It's going to depend on every crop that you're growing. For example, for me with lettuce, it's like lettuce and beets. It's like three or four weeks seems to be the sweet spot. Make sure you're hardening them off before you get them, get them out there. And, uh, and those sorts of things, just, you want to think about, you just want to think about like what environment do these plants need to be in to, for them to survive and make sure that they're strong enough to go out and make it. Because if you plant things out and they don't make it, you're just wasting time and it sucks. <laughs> so there's no specific time. It's It depends on the crop and the time of the year. Because if I'm 
doing stuff in the nursery in the wintertime, things are going to take way longer than they are, you know, late spring or into the summer. So like with everything in farming, there's no like set rules on it takes this much time unless you like live somewhere where it's exactly the same every day, which I don't know anyone that lives in a place like that. So those are my guidelines. Um, as I said, like if you keep doing this, you know, if you're, if you're like, I want lettuce to be, I keep using lettuce for example, cause I grow a lot of lettuce, but if you want lettuce to be your main crop, You'll start figuring it out after a few rounds. You'll say, okay, well, I put them out at four weeks. I think they were a little too big. Like you looked at the transplants and it looked a little too big. They were like starting to grow on each other and you're ripping off the roots apart. Or you, you're like, all right, next time I'll do it at three weeks. But when you take them out, you could see that the root structure hasn't really taken over the soil block. They're kind of weak. So you'll find that balance where they're just about right. You'll know for sure um, after trying it a few times. And, and just like looking at the plants and using your gut instinct, you'll be able to, you'll be able to tell. So similar question here. Usually I find that if I don't put them out at the right time, like if they're too small or too weak or um, not hardened off well, they just don't make it. So to me, I would probably, if they're, if you're late for your planting, then I'd probably wait for another bed and plant something else in that bed in the meantime. So I'm gonna talk about this in the next couple modules, but one thing you can do is keep some um, stuff on hand to do some direct seeding. The carrots are a great one for me. So if I have a bed that's open and I don't have anything to go in it, I just I just plant a bed of carrots because carrots, everyone wants carrots or whatever the crop is for you. And then open up another bed in a few weeks. Like you just don't want to put the plants out to just let them die because you wasted the time and the money and the, the seeds and the soil blocks are in the soil. You wasted your energy getting, the, getting out in the field and planting them and paying attention to them and all that stuff, and then they don't make it. So I think I learned that in the first year pretty hard was that just because you have your idea of when things are going to happen does not mean that that's the time that it's going to happen until you understand all the variables and have some experience. Things don't go to plan. <laughs> I think we all have to accept that a lot of the time and, um, and make adjustments. And sometimes your, your plan doesn't work out. And so that's why when I talked about in the crop planning module that, you know, have a plan, but there's some flexibility in it. Like it's not always going to work out. And sometimes you have to make adjustments. No, I don't have the sprout island. It's like seed. I would go check, but it's like not near me right now. <laughs> um Hey, Trav, good to see you in here. Hey, James. Uh, yeah, Elliot Coleman's recipe, I think it works great. Like a lot of people have used it. Um, if you are doing, I've never tried it, but if you're doing a large amount of potting mix, then sure, it probably is more cost effective. I think in Daniel May's book too, he's got a recipe. I think he makes his own too. If you haven't checked that book out, that's a great resource. Um, Daniel Mays from Fifth Farm has got an awesome book on no-till farming. He's got all sorts of stuff about soil blocks. And I think he's got a potting mix recipe in there too. So check that book out for sure. Um, but what I found, and similarly, I'll, let me take a step back about making your own potting mix. I'll tell you a little story here. So when I got into all of this stuff, I had chickens. Most of you know if you've been following the channel for a while. And I was like, I'm going to DIY everything. I'm going to build my own nursery. I'm going to um, mix my own chicken feed. I'm going to everything, right? And then it was like such a pain to source all of the ingredients that I needed for like, let's say the chicken feed. I had to get all the different mixes and nutrients and, and all the different like elements to it. And I spent so much time and then I had leftover bags of this and leftover bags of that. And it just wasn't worth it. Like for me to pay an extra, even though it was 10 cents a pound or 20 cents a pound to like get a really nice mix that worked really well from people that know way more about this than I do. Like I'm going to pay for that for sure. And so that's sort of my thought process with a lot of things now. It's like this person's way better at this than I am. I don't need to worry about it. Like I'll just pay for them to do it. So again, if you can't get a good potty mix, but you can get a lot of the ingredients, totally makes sense. If you're doing it on huge scale and labors, it makes sense for your labor. Absolutely. If you just like tinkering and maybe you're not doing this on a commercial level, absolutely. Um, I think, I, I don't know if Elliot's recipe, if they're still using that at um, Four Season Farm, but I know a lot of people have used it and it does work. So 
Again, go watch that video that Jesse did on the Notes of Growers channel, like why he doesn't make his own potting mix. He has a, a lot of the <laughs> same thoughts that I just talked about and uh, um, make some good points in there. So go check that out. Abraham, have I grafted tomatoes? I have not grafted tomatoes before. Um, yeah, that would totally have fit in this module. I just, I don't do it and I've never done it before. And also, um, I don't grow tomatoes anymore. And I've said this in other places, but I stopped growing them because the squirrels ate all my tomatoes. Like they ate all my tomatoes. And so I just gave up on tomatoes. I'm not having that battle anymore. It was heartbreaking. I had like 180 or almost 200 tomato plants one year and my whole little greenhouse was full of cherry tomatoes like it was it was amazing and all of a sudden they just got emptied and they probably ate 80 percent of my tomatoes and then i started pulling them off at first blush and letting them ripe inside and then they started eating the green ones and it was just like <laughs> work with nature not against it so i gave up on tomatoes so i haven't grafted tomatoes i don't have any experience with that so i, I couldn't share anything and i think that's also like part of this course is that i can only really share my systems on my farm and what i've learned and, and how i make it work um farming is too big in general to cover everything for sure um so i'm just sharing what i got going on so yeah i don't i'm not a good resource for that um grafting tomatoes Hey Jake, Zone 6B, Farmer's Friend, Gothic Pro. I want to grow beets for the fall. Not sure when to start. So beets are like three or four weeks in, in soil blocks before they go out. So, you know, if you want to plant them in September, start them in August. Is that the month before? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. We're still here. Yeah, that book is awesome. Dan Daniel is such a cool dude. There are different insert sides for the hole in the soil block. Do you change with the seed side? Huh, I don't have that option in my soil blocker. It's just like it comes with the little plastic piece that's up at the top that presses down and it's one size to make that dimple. Um, I don't think the hole size matters so much as long as the seed fits inside of the hole and then you can cover it up. So, you know, most seeds that I'm doing like beets, lettuce, I don't know, kale, like the seeds are not that big, but if you're going to get into bigger stuff like squash or cucumbers, uh, those things that have bigger seeds, you probably want to plant them into bigger soil blocks too. Uh, cause generally those plants like get really big really quickly like cucumbers and squash grow pretty fast so if i think that this the whole size that i have in my soil blocks is kind of matched perfectly for the block size because if it was a bigger opening for the hole it would probably be too close to the edge and if for to accept a large seed like that i'd probably want to put in a larger block so i'm sure it sounds like you have a different blocker than i do but i would probably say that like the whole size doesn't really matter as long as you can get the seed in there and then cover it Unless you have a different question, I'm not understanding you, Pierre Ann. All right. <laughs> oh, I hear the thunderstorm starting up. <laughs> We have this, oh, I just hope we don't lose power. We, it, we often lose power with thunderstorms. I don't know, happened a couple weeks ago. Hope that doesn't happen right now. We'll find out. All right, so more questions on nursery stuff and uh, then I'll get on to general questions because it's 3.45 here. Happy to take some questions about whatever. You guys brought some great questions today though. I really do appreciate it. And one thing as a uh, as a teacher, right? Most of you know I taught high school for five years. It's great when you ask a question because most likely someone else has the same question. They just don't want to ask it. I realized that a, a while ago when I was teaching. So 
I used to never be a question asker in class, but now I ask questions all the time. <laughs> I don't know if any of you feel that way too. A little bit easier if you're just chatting though, right? On the computer. Let's see here. Let's get some questions in. General questions are fine at this point. Let's see, there was a question here. Hey Jeff, uh, question on the course. You mind covering how to get started with say on business account licensing insurance? I don't feel confident giving people advice on that. And that's why I don't really talk about it because I usually don't want to give anyone legal advice or business advice. Like like business, like in terms of business plan, planning, that sort of stuff. I covered a lot of that in the early modules, like one, two, three. But in terms of like licensing, accounting, I don't want to get into that stuff because I don't want to give people recommendations. Uh, I don't have enough expertise to be steering people in the right or wrong direction. So... That's why I don't get into that stuff. Um, so sorry about that, Jeff. We're just really, I, I don't, I usually say like talk to an accountant, talk to an attorney. Like I don't want to get anyone in trouble for things that I do because <laughs> uh, I'm not an expert in that stuff. And that's one thing about like, I've always been pretty upfront about like, if I don't know something, I'm like, I don't know, don't listen to me about this or I just won't say anything about it. So that's why I didn't cover that stuff. Um, I can say for me, I have a single member LLC. That's how I have my business set up. So it's a pretty easy thing to set up. You, um, in North Carolina, you, well, I think it's pretty true in every state. You get your EIN, which is your employee identification number from the government, from the federal government, from the secretary, secretary of state, the IRS, sorry, the IRS. And then you register your business with your state through the secretary of state and you get your business license. So that's how you get register a business. Um, I did that in Massachusetts and in North Carolina. So that's how you get started. But uh, beyond that, like, please, like, go talk to an accountant, talk to an attorney, like, cover your butt. Make sure you're not getting in trouble. <clears throat> hey, Abraham. So why would I not sell at farmer's markets? Great question. So the biggest thing for me was I did not want to give up my Saturdays every Saturday. And... That was the biggest thing for me. My wife, you know, works during the week. My kids are at school during the week. I don't want to be tied every Saturday or every Saturday, Sunday, or every Sunday at the farmer's market. That was the that was the main thing for me uh, from keeping me doing that. And now I tend to work every day anyway, so maybe it wouldn't be, make such a big difference. But going to market is a commitment. It's tiring. It's hard in the summer. Um, it is a great way to get started. I think I would have become... A, probably had, would have had more success in my farm business early if I had just done that from the beginning. But I can be stubborn about some things. So that was just, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to commit on Saturdays. That was my main reasoning or Sundays or whatever. Yeah, that video was um, David Williams from Sunset Market Gardens. I did a bunch of videos of David on my channel and also on the No-Till Growers channel. And I think there was one, I think it was on the No-Till Growers channel about his nursery setup. So if you want the full story, um, check that out. I don't know, I don't remember the name of the, the video, but. Oh man, it's like pouring rain right now, okay. Hey, B. David A. Also in the East Coast, my wooded residential lot has lots of trees that I'm going to clear. How much space around my beds needs to be clear enough for sun? Um, you don't want them to create any shade uh, on your on your beds if possible. And so I've I've been open about this that I don't have enough. I get too much shade during certain parts of the year for sure where I don't get enough sunlight. So I really need more space around my beds than I have. So there's a couple things going on there. One is sunlight. The other thing is you never want to plant under the drip, what is it called, the drip ring? No, I forget what it's called. Like basically you don't want to plant under a tree because um, it'll be taking nutrients and water and stuff. So um, the other thing you want to think about is if a tree falls, is it going to land on your beds, on your tunnel, you know, stuff like that. Um, I had a tree come down a couple months ago and luckily it hit my shed and it was just, maybe you guys saw that on Instagram, but it was like, dangling over um, my my tunnel and we had to cut it down. I got really lucky. So I'd say you want to think about trees falling and also the shade. So the further away from the trees, the better for sure. Um, if that means growing less, I think you'll be happier in the long run for sure. 
You can always take down the amount of sunlight by adding shade cloth, but you can't increase the amount of sunlight unless you cut down trees or grow in a like, smaller area. <clears throat> um, my approach is the same with all weeds. So tarp until everything's dead and then build lasagna beds. If you think the biggest thing which I've said so many times, like make sure everything's dead, dead, dead. Make sure it's really dead before you start. Otherwise, it's going to keep coming back. And sometimes it might take a year to kill everything. And if you do plant and it isn't dead yet and you have a, a consistent perpetual weed situation, just cover it again. Just put a tarp over your beds and make sure everything dies. That's really the best thing you can do. It's hard. It's, it's You have to be very patient. And with a lot of the things in my system and a lot of things with these no-till practices, you're planning so far ahead of time so that you don't have to spend time doing as much weeding, doing as much labor if it's like because you laid out your farm properly and like you manage your, you know, minimize your footsteps steps and things like that. And there are some times like if I don't stay on top of cultivating, like some beds will get weedy. And if that happens, I sometimes just like, I'll pull everything out I can and then just throw a piece of landscape fabric over for a couple weeks and just pause it and come back to it when everything's dead and then just don't disturb it and plant into it again. So it's okay to like not be successful in everything that you do, but make sure that you realize what's going on and take enough time and um, patience to, to take care of it in that way. Otherwise, like it will just keep coming back and keep coming back for sure. <clears throat> Hi, Sheena. Yeah, that video was awesome. That was so much fun with Jesse. Um, I think it was one of my favorite videos I've made. Definitely, I think it was definitely my favorite uh, collaboration video I made with Jesse. We've made a few. Uh, every time we get together, we always make videos together. So, um, yeah, that was a great video for sure. Uh, I forget what the video is called. Tips and tricks about farmer's market or something like that. Side note, Jesse sent me a picture of a bagel yesterday when he was at market. <laughs> So that really is what Jesse does. He goes and gets bagels and then goes to the farmer's market. Let's see here. More about last week. Oh, more irrigation questions. Cool. Dude, I'm just pumped you guys are in here with questions. So <laughs> some days uh, there aren't as many questions. And I always talk fast to try to answer them all. So, all right, let's see here. How big of an acre, how big of an area does one drip emitter cover? I'm installed at Sullivan, had a dry period to test actual use. So depends. I don't know the area, but what I recommend is that, let me back up, not just the area that it covers, but every emitter will vary how much water it puts out. Everyone's like graded differently for how many gallons per minute per 100 feet or whatever. But also your soil type's going to matter a lot too. So if you have really sandy soil, for example, the water comes out of the emitter, it's going to go in the ground, it's going to go straight down, it's going to drain right through. If you have really heavy clay soil or whatever, your soil type is going to dictate like how much it soaks in and sort of spreads out as well. So what I recommend is that you get as many lines down as you can that's feasible for the number of crops. So uh, I think I said this in the module. So like if you're doing lettuce, I put three rows of drip. Or if I'm doing like um, beets, that's three rows. I'll do two rows, two rows of drip. Put as many as you can and then just observe. I uh, run it for a certain amount of time every day and then make adjustments. And also try to get the drip tape that the emitters are as close together as possible. I think traditionally uh, a lot of people would buy like ones that were 12 inches apart or further because it was made for row cropping on much larger scale or something. So uh, my drip spacing I think is, I forget what I said in the module, 8 inches. But maybe you can get it 6 inches or less. It uh, gives you more flexibility because if you're planting plants that are Let's say you're doing squash that are like 18 inches apart and your emitters are like only every, sorry, let's say your plants are closer together and then you have emitters that are spaced out every 12 inches, like they're not going to land near all the, all the crops. So closer spacing, more, more rows of it for sure. And don't be afraid to hand water if like you need to every once in a while. I definitely hand, I walk out and I'm checking on the irrigation all the time. And then if there's an area that's not as, you know, irrigated, like I'll just hand water it. So. Also an option.
Thanks, Gina. If you guys are also curious, um, I don't know if you know, if you're if you're sort of just new to my channel and stuff, I'm not saying you, Sheena, in particular, but I did a show called Growers Live on the No Till Growers channel. It was every other week I interviewed a farmer live for over a year. So there's a lot of great interviews, and they're live and interactive with the chat and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff in there for sure. Tiny House, you're very welcome. Hey, Alan. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't know what video that was in. It was... One of my watching station videos from this year when I rebuilt the farm, I put these little pieces of PVC screwed into the top that kind of helped wedge the basket in, and they're just starting to come out, so I need to find another solution. I've heard some people using, someone said put a piece of like PEX, like maybe half inch PEX maybe is flexible enough, I'm not sure. I haven't tried that, but I need to come up with a new solution because the little pieces, I just cut like, I think it was in the washing machine video. Yeah, the, the video I did about washing, the washing machine, I put these little pieces of PVC, like four of them around equally, and then the basket just sat in there. So that's what I did. I need to fix it because they're coming out now. <laughs> but yeah, make sure that thing's wedged in pretty good. <clears throat> hey, Caroline, I don't know what that is. Is that like a CSA type, type deal? <laughs> Bagels on Sundays. Hey, Raphael. Happy Monday, buddy. <laughs> uh, best budget drip system. So I find that drip is pretty inexpensive um, just because if you buy a big spool of drip tape and a few connectors and some, I mean, like if you watch the irrigation video, um, the irrigation module, the last module or two modules ago, and also the other videos I've done on irrigation on the channel, um, the parts aren't very expensive. I think the timer is probably the most expensive thing and that was like 50 bucks or 60 bucks. So if you buy a big spool of the drip tape, you'll get a lot of beds out of it. The connectors are like a dollar, dollar fifty a piece and then a bunch of the irrigation line, a couple fittings. Like it's really not that expensive for the amount of area that you can cover with it. Um, as I said, I like to buy the thicker irrigation tape because it lasts longer. So you don't have to replace it as often. Um, I find that I like the overhead kit from Farmers Farm because it really fit my tunnel perfectly. But I think if you buy a drip system, unless it's like, I think Farmers Friend even sells one for their tunnels, but everyone's farm is so different and beds are different lengths and you're gonna need slightly different things. So it's just easy enough to build it yourself. It doesn't really, I don't think there's a good kit for that. I know I'm a big fan of kits and everything, but that's what I'd recommend. The Muji Fuji. Nice. You've <laughs> yeah, it's a cool market. It was fun to go hang out there for sure. It was also really cool if you guys haven't seen that video because I, I never go to farmer's markets uh, as a seller. So it was really cool to, to uh, experience on the other side of it. And if you're curious about sourcing for irrigation stuff, I've used three companies. So Drip Depot, Dripworks, and Berry Hill I used recently. They were they're all fine. No no issues with them. Jadam is super cool. I don't know much about it. Um, I know a lot of people are really into that stuff. Um, and K and F as well. I haven't experimented much with it, so I can't really speak on positives, negatives, if it work in my system. Uh, I'm just kind of in the, the time now where I'm like, I like everything's working. So I don't want to like screw with it too much. Um, and for me, it'll be like a few different crops here and there working on my compost systems, things like that. Uh, like we're making some leaf mold this year, which I've never done before. Um, and really dialing the compost situation or making as much as we can. Those are things I'm working on right now, but yeah, I mean, I know about it. I don't know much about it to tell you anything unique about Jadam, but there's a lot of cool stuff coming out of that. And I think it's always cool to take bits and pieces of lots of different styles of agriculture and gardening and farming to make your own. I think that's always cool. Um, a lot of options out there for sure. Hey, Eric. Yep. With a spring? Oh, a spring. Okay. Like... 
Yeah, I just use landscape staples on the end. The ends of mine have the like the cap with a like a ring on it made out of plastic, and I just landscape st staple that in. But yeah, when it gets hot, they they tend to like expand and contract, and so yeah, they can tend to slide around. I'm having to shove them in the ground all the time. Maybe I just need some like more hardcore landscape staples. Maybe that's just the answer. It can get frustrating though. I know people ask, how do you get your lines so straight? I'm like, I'm constantly fiddling with them. <laughs> it's probably a better way to do that. All right, what other questions do you have? Let's see if I missed anything. All right, we'll wait for a couple more questions to come in. Um, let's see here. So just a reminder, next module coming on Thursday will be about transplanting and interplanting, which is fantastic. Uh, direct seeding after that. And then I think tools and equipment. So as I said before, this will this course will continue every week. There won't be another break. Uh, I took that spring break to go on vacation, but otherwise it should push through and end up sort of in the beginning of July. I think it's going to be 19 weeks uh, when it's all said and done. But again, every module will be out Thursday morning, nice and early, <laughs> if you want to catch that while you're eating breakfast or whatever. And then, uh, again, these live Q&As every Monday at 3 p.m. Let's see here. Thanks, Sheena. <laughs> Can't be su super serious all the time, right? I was always the uh, the teacher that was like goofing off, and then it was like time to get down to business. It was time to get down to business. That's that was always my strategy. Yeah, I I, I hear you with the compost. Yeah, it, there's a lot of force pulling on those lines. So I think like longer landscape staples, or sort of like go through the compost into the native soil. Maybe that would work. I don't know. I want to hear more about Eric's spring design, though. That sounds pretty cool. I don't know if that would be too much for me with all my beds and everything. City water versus well water filters. Yeah, uh, James, we covered this hardcore in the uh, the last live Q&A. Uh, we talked about this for like 20 minutes probably. It really depends on, you know, where you are and if you have access to a well. Um, usually I'd say go with that because it's free and it doesn't have chemicals in it from, you know, municipal water. Uh, the only filtration I use is uh, a sediment filter to take any chunks out of my water so that it doesn't clog up the, the valves in my um, my timers. That's the only filtration that I use. But if you're using city water, uh, there's filters to take out chlorine and stuff. So again, I'd probably, I think I covered this in the irrigation module and definitely in the last live Q&A. We talked about this for a while. So go check that out if you want to hear more about that. Uh, I can't. T.L. Damien, thank you so much. Thanks, Abraham. Yeah, uh, also, if I'll say this again. I say this every week. Uh, if you're looking for specific information, like even if it's a module that you know is coming up and you want to get some information now, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's a search icon on the upper right-hand screen. Like, Click on the actual channel. Click on the search. You can type in a topic. If you want to know interplanting, type in interplanting. If you want to see every video, every video I've ever done about lettuce, type in lettuce. Uh, and it'll open those all up for you. So it's another option if you're just looking for information. And I always remind people because I know a lot of people don't know that that search engine exists on everybody's YouTube channel. So it can be really handy, not just on my channel. <laughs> if you're going to other people's channels and you're like, oh, this I love this cooking channel. When did they make you know pizza? And you can type in pizza and you'll see all their pizza videos. So definitely handy. All right, you're very welcome. Sounds like uh, questions are slowing down. So maybe we'll wrap up and... We'll see you next week. So keep a lookout for the module. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's support. And of course, big thanks to PaperPot as usual. Thank all of you guys for watching and supporting and coming in and asking questions and, uh, and all that. Um, hope you guys are having a great season. We'll see you soon.